Well, we're turning back to where we were in Sunday school this morning. I did not get as far as I intended. Um, but I think because of the nature of what we're trying to do, we will be able to put these things together this afternoon in terms of taking up the scriptures with purpose, um, the idea of taking up the scriptures personally. Uh, my desire is to help you. It really was in, initially intended as a Sunday school message and to go home with us and help us as we take up the Word of God to interact with the Word of God, the text of the Word of God. And so we saw this morning uh, from John chapter 16, our posture is to be expectancy with Holy Spirit illumination. The Holy Spirit gave us the scriptures through various authors and the Holy Spirit is the one that teaches us the scripture. And if you did not get that notation, that's from John chapter 16. Jesus said, I will send my Holy Spirit and he will teach you uh, the scriptures and give us understanding. It says in verse 13 of John 16, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, referring to the Holy Spirit that he's talking about in this text. First of all, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Secondly, he will show you things to come. In this context, this is spoken to the disciples as they're about to begin their mission. So the Holy Spirit will give them, give us mission direction or how to proceed. And then verse 14 says, he shall glorify me. So a threefold spirit of truth ministry is guiding us into all truth showing us things to come, how to proceed in his mission and purposes. And thirdly, in verse 14, he shall glorify me. Expectancy with Holy Spirit illumination. Secondly, humility with personal application. We're noting this morning that the word of God teaches us about God. We interact with the word of God and he tells us about himself, reveals himself to us. And yet we aren't finished with the scriptures until we have made application to our lives, until we intend to do something with it, until we're thinking about how this uh, thing, what we have read, this section of scripture or these verses uh, apply to our lives. And so we have to come with humility um, for personal application, awareness of our own need, first and foremost, uh, coming with poverty of spirit, bringing nothing except our need uh, to the Lord. Well, secondly, um, and that was as far as we got this morning, there is this process. And all I'm doing here is trying to remind you that as image bearers, um, we know certain things about God. We bear his image. Our God is a thinking God. Our God is a feeling God. You see that throughout the scripture. Our God is an acting God. Our God's a God of decision and choice. And so when he's revealing himself to us, he does it through our minds, right? He teaches us about himself. He governs our emotions and then he guides us in our decisions. So first of all, the process is, and here's the first blank, mind engaged. When we take up the word of God, our minds need to be engaged. Uh, I wish I could say that to you, that that's automatic. I find that not to be true. Um, and I think many of you would affirm this. You really have to settle your soul, get yourself attentive. Uh, many times you have to have a place designated where you are apart. You know, at times you can read portions of scripture when you find yourself in a waiting place, right? A waiting room or waiting for an appointment or something of that nature. But this, this has to do with a planning uh, to have our minds engaged, mind engaged. First of all, uh, what or how does this passage teach me to think? How, what or how does this passage teach me to think? What does this passage teach me to think? How does this passage teach me to think? And you may think, well, we don't really need to be taught how to think. Actually, that's exactly what education is doing. It's teaching you how to think. Um, it, it really is as you move along in education. I remember I taught fifth grade in Chicago and I was teaching basically 31 kids and I was teaching them essentially the same thing the fourth grade teacher and the sixth grade teacher was teaching them. And you people that have been in a homeschool situation understand what they do is pretty much introduce these things in the fourth grade. I was in the middle trying to get these things home to the kids. And by the time they graduated from the sixth grade, the guy that followed me, they should be ready for 
junior high for seventh grade. What we were doing was not just teaching facts, even though there are some facts and things that are being taught, but you're actually teaching how to think. By the time you get to college, and particularly as Christians, what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn how to think God's thoughts after him, think God's way. The world's way of thinking is completely against that. Your natural way of thinking is against that. I know that and you know that because it says we need to what? Renew our minds renew our minds. So if you go to the word with a bunch of assumptions, uh, you really don't benefit as you should. If you go to the word saying, you know, the Lord himself created me, he will teach me how to think. He will teach me what he thinks. He will teach me how to think his thoughts after him. Very hard to come to the scripture without your own thoughts, right? It's very difficult. And it's very difficult not to tweak the scripture to fit your own thoughts. So I'm talking about a discipline that causes you and me to just sit before God and say, Lord, I want you to teach me how to think. I want you to teach me what to think. You say, for example, God created the heaven and the earth. What do you think about how things began? God created the heavens and the earth, <laughs> right? Uh, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. What do you think about the incarnation? That Jesus Christ was virgin born. God taught me what to think. God taught me how to think about that. And we come that way and we got eternal truth in our, in our hands. Uh, then that is a constant renewing process that Satan, the world, the flesh is going to intercept and fight against. So um, that's where we start our mind engaged. What or how does this passage teach me to think? Secondly, emotions surrendered, surrendered. What should I feel in response to the truth revealed? What should I feel in response to the truth revealed? Another way you can turn that and ask that is, do my emotions match or reflect those of my Lord? How often is God angry at sin? Always. Always. It's completely against his nature. It flies in the face of the creator. How often am I angry about sin? Well, that depends. <laughs> if somebody sins against me, I can get pretty passionate. <laughs> But sometimes I can ignore sin in my own life. How should I feel about sin? I should feel about sin the way God feels about it. Sin is very costly. God slayed animals and slayed his son to deal with what? Our sin. That's how God feels about sin. And so when you talk about emotions, don't, don't disengage. I know their you know, religious system, that's all it is, is emotion. God didn't create us all emotion. He created us to think. But he also created us to feel. And otherwise, your Christianity becomes very mechanical. You don't feel anything in that relationship. Something is really wrong. How do I love? You know, God tells me how to love and God shows me how to love. And tells me the fruit of the Spirit is love. And so there's an emotional dynamic to love, as you know. So the mind engaged. What or how does the passage teach me to think? Emotions surrendered. What should I feel in response to the truth revealed? Do my emotions match or reflect those of my Lord? Do I love what he loves? Do I love like he loves? <laughs> Am I angry at what angers him? Am I passionate about what he's passionate about? And, and many times I, I have to answer that. No, but I want to be. No, I don't find that automatic in my soul. I think Paul addresses that in Romans 7, but that's what I want. How about our will? Our will is active, put active. Mind engaged, emotion surrendered, will active. What decision does this passage call for? What, does, what decision? What is my intentional application of this truth that I'm being taught by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, through his word? Will, my will active. What decision does this passage call for? So if I'm in the word of God and I come to a passage that speaks against something that I'm actively doing, what action should I take? I should confess. The word confess means to say the same thing as God says. I should say the same thing God says about my sin. I'm saying, Lord, I didn't tell the truth. And your word says that I shouldn't lie. And so I'm saying the same thing that you say about my lying. It's wrong. It's offensive to you. And I need to confess it. And I need to what? Repent of it. Forsake it. Go another direction. So he tells me to love my wife. And he puts his finger on 
something I said or something I did and says, now see right there, you didn't cherish her, you didn't love her. So I am now in the place of needing to make a decision in regards to that and that is making these things right and determining by God's grace, I will obey him and love her and cherish her as God tells me to do. And what I love about all of this is it can be very, very individual. <laughs> me and God. Him speaking to me, him convicting me, him leading me. And yet I can also say to you, knowing God's people, he can do that in your life and our lives together. He can be doing that in my wife's life. He can be doing that in my young people's lives that are in my home. He can be doing that in the life of my church. But if we don't understand this and we don't think this way, we're just kind of mechanically going through information. You know, another chapter, another song. We just kind of, it's just kind of stuff on a page. But it's not just stuff on a page. And some of you have, been, uh, have moved through education. You applied yourself. I know that because you moved through it. <laughs> it demanded something of you. Why is it that we think we're going to put our feet up in a lounger, take the word of God out and benefit from it? It's just not going to happen. And so I'm encouraging you as I'm encouraging myself in this. Turn back to 2 Timothy 3.16. Let me show you something you're already familiar with, but let me do it in the context of taking up the scriptures personally. And all, all we're trying to do is, is actively engage with what the Bible says so that we can take home something with us that, that activates us in this, that causes us to be more personally involved as we come before the Lord. Our whole soul, right? To love the Lord with all our heart, soul, and mind means we're going to have to be whole soul involved. And back up to verse number 14 and let it lead us down into verse number, basically right into up to 17. This is 2 Timothy 3 and verse 14. As Paul talks to uh, Timothy, he says, but continue in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, we have a number of times through the years taken on the material in, in this section, but also right here in verse number 16. It uses four different words to speak about the profit of the word of God, of the scripture. Because it's, it's God speaking. It's what he's breathed out. It came from his mind. It came from his mouth. Yeah, the mouth of the Lord has spoken is an Old Testament uh, testimony of those that wrote the scripture. So let's raise a, the questions in conjunction with the words. First of all, what doctrine is taught that I must believe? You see the first question there? Doctrine. What doctrine? Which is the teachings of the scripture. What doctrine? What uh, right? What uh, right is taught to me that I must believe? What doctrine is taught that I must believe? Secondly, what sin does this text reprove? In my own life, I'm looking and I'm saying, okay, it's profitable for doctrine. It teaches me what's right, but it's also profitable to reprove me. It reproves things in my life. So what sin does this text reprove? Now you take up 1 Corinthians 13, like I do. And you go, wow, all those characteristics of love. And, and, and you can look at those and you can study those and you are working through those and, and you come back time and time again to that text. And you're saying, how, what does this show me about my lack of love? My love doesn't look like this. I'm not long suffering. Okay. That's where it's reproving me. It convinces me of error. That's what reprove means. It convinces me of error. Well, thirdly. There is uh, another word in our text. It's, it's for correction. What in my life is corrected here? What is corrected here? Correction is, is that that exposes some contradiction. <laughs> it exposes some contradiction and it sets it right. You know, you're the doctor and you've had an accident and you've broken a bone and he, he corrects it. He sets it right. This idea of exposing the contradiction and setting it right. Uh, what in my life is corrected here? And then the last word used in verse number 16 is the word instruction and in righteousness. 
So lastly, how am I trained to live more pleasingly before God? It's the idea of putting off the self-pleasing life and putting on a life that pleases God because righteousness is a word that means that which pleases God. So what doctrine is taught that I must believe? So I'm reading through a passage of Scripture, and I try to do this when I'm teaching you in the, in the services. So this morning I took that last, the next to last verse and showed you that Abraham used a name for God that he had not used before. And God is what? He's everlasting. He is Jehovah, the everlasting God. And so when I look at that and I say, so what doctrine is taught that I must believe? And that is that he is Jehovah God, the everlasting God. Remember earlier in Genesis, it taught us that he is almighty. So what doctrinal truth, what is being taught there that I must believe? I must believe that God is almighty. I must believe that he can do whatever he desires to do and he will do whatever he promises to do. Same thing with sin and correction in my life and training to be more pleasing to the Lord. So as you can see, the idea of application is coming to the word of God expectantly and asking questions of the text of the word of God so that you, you really do land on what God is saying and you do benefit from what God is saying. You say the Holy Spirit, can you help me to understand this? <laughs> Can you help me to understand this? You say, the Holy Spirit, can you help me to put off my preconceptions when I come to this? And this is very difficult sometimes because we do have ideas. We do have preconceived ideas. So for further meditation, we're going to mutter these things. We're going to chew on these things as we saw this morning. Uh, these are simple questions, and, and they're basically general questions that you can add to, but I wanted to offer them to you as a help to you. Is there, first of all, is there a truth to embrace by faith and act upon? Is there a truth here to embrace by faith and act upon? Okay, let's go back to the rule of God in our lives. Thou shalt not steal. So you stole something. What do you do now? You got to act on that, right? You've got to seek God's forgiveness. You've got to seek the forgiveness of who you stole it from. And you've got to do what? Give it back. <laughs> right? And do the consequences of what you did. So is there a truth to embrace by faith and act on? That's a very a simple illustration, but I think you're getting the idea. Okay, I'm asking that question of the text. Is there something I need to do with this? Secondly, is there an attribute of God for which to praise him? You know, sometimes what happens in the scripture is we just, like we did this morning, he is Jehovah, the everlasting God. That's an attribute of God for which to praise him. Uh, I praise you, Lord, that you are. Boy, the book of Psalms is just full of this. It just declares truth after truth about God and who he is. God, I'm thankful you're holy. <laughs> thankful you're not like the gods that come to my mind. You're not like a God that I would create in my own image because I'm not holy. I'm thankful that you are holy. Is there an attribute of God for which we praise him? How about his mercy? How about his forgiveness? How about Abraham? He faltered and failed and demonstrated to us that part of the promise, part of the covenant relationship is the Lord brings that to light. The Lord even overrules that. Now, sometimes you listen to people talk and they're like, well, you know, I know that I'm probably not functioning based upon what the scripture says, but God works it out. Well, we need to slow down there because the Bible says we know that we love him when we do what? Obey him. So, folks, we can outsmart ourselves. We can start navigating life as if, well, you know, God is providential and he worked it all out anyway, even though we don't want to live that way. That's not walking with the Lord. That's not fellowshipping with the Lord. But we can be thankful that he providentially advances his purposes. It doesn't mean that he approves of our disobedience. He can't because he's holy. That's why when you think about God, the first thing you think about always is his holiness because every other attribute reflects his holiness, who he is at, at his core. Is there a sin to confess or avoid? Is that, that's number three there. I think that's where we are. Is there a sin to confess or avoid? Fourthly, is there a command to obey? Just turning these things 
and you can turn them different ways. Just turning these things to, to, to really engage my soul with what the Bible says. Is there a truth here to embrace by faith and act on? Is, is it calling for me to do something? Is there a command here? Is, is there an attribute of God for which to praise him? When you're done reading from the Psalms, you should pray and praise him for what he just taught you about himself. Is there sin to confess or avoid? Uh, Proverbs is full of warnings for the young man from his father. Is, is there sin to confess, but also is there sin to avoid? Fourthly, is there a command to obey? Fifthly, is there a warning to heed? Is there something in here that warns me? Again, back to Proverbs. You don't want to go down that road. You don't want to go near her house. You don't want to hang out with those people. Is there a warning to heed? Is there an example? Next to last question, is there an example to imitate or avoid? Maybe God puts something, he does. He puts before us a, an example that we're to avoid, stay away from. And other times he gives us an example that we're to imitate or follow. And then lastly, is there a promise to claim? Is there a promise to claim? Has God said something here that he's brought to my heart and to my mind and, and I can praise him for that and, and recognize that he will never leave me. He will never forsake me. Now, could I say something in closing, not an intent to confuse you, but an intent to clarify for you. The Bible's inerrant. So what does that mean? Without error. Your understanding and your application is not. We swallow that, don't we? By the very nature of who we are, folks, we do not always get it right. Okay? Now, does that mean we throw up our hands? No, we thank God his words inerrant. But that means we anchor down and say, by God's grace, I want to understand as best I can and apply it as best I can, knowing that because of who I am and my fallenness, I won't ever get it all right. Kind of puts a pin in the hypocrisy, Pharisee thing, doesn't it? Okay, we'll do our best to understand our God because he has perfectly revealed himself. But we will not always understand it perfectly or apply it perfectly. And I think that calls us to a graciousness, doesn't it? it calls us to us, really. You know what? And you'll, I was just talking to one of our young men today. You'll understand something 10 years from now you don't understand now. So let's not walk around our Christian life slapping people around for things they don't understand. <laughs> you don't get it all either. And you didn't get it that six months ago. You get it now. And our humanist just wants to kind of get all ruffled up, don't we? Boy, I see this. Why can't you see this? You know the answer to that, don't you? The same reason you didn't see it six months ago. It just gives us that. Take a deep breath and recognize God's right all the time. His word is perfect. Your understanding of mine is not, and our application is not. And let's be very gracious uh, as we make our way through this Christian walk. And let's be very expectant as we take up the word of God and invite him to teach us. He can do that beyond me, how he does that, how he knows. I'm praying on, in the morning. I'm thinking about you folks. He's praying and she's praying and he's over here and she's down there. And then you expand that out and go, it doesn't take very long for good to much bigger than we are. Right. And recognize he's here in all of us perfectly. He knows every need. Wants us to know that he knows every hair falls out of our head. And we're how? Because he's God. He's that much bigger than we are. And yet he wants to help us understand. He really wants us to live the way he's called us to live. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have revealed who you are, and we can praise you for that. Thank you that we are constantly in process and that we can never declare that we have everything understood perfectly. Certainly, there are clear things that you have said that we have to make decisions to obey or disobey. But in the end, it's not that you weren't perfect in your revelation. It's that we're imperfect in our understanding and our application. And Father, I pray that you would just remove that sinful pride from us. That you would enhance our fellowship with you and with each other. That Father, we would be teachable and moldable. 
that we would understand, even in terms of the body you put together, Father, that you've gifted every person here. We're part of a body, and, and we've made us different. We've got different personalities, had different experiences, different levels of understanding, and yet we're here in the body to minister to one another for your honor and glory, to live for the head. Help us to grow in our appreciation for the differences. Father, help us as well to be anchored to the fact that you have revealed your word because you want us to draw close to you, fellowship with you, understand you, praise you, worship you, and serve you. And may that be the testimony of our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.